Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation's panel about our case against AT&T. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm here with my colleagues, Jason Schultz, Cindy Cohen, and Kevin Bankston. Uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief uh, introduction. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with us, but uh, how many of you are uh, EFF members? Yay! All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we, we appreciate your support. Uh, we're glad so many uh, of our members come from this, uh, this audience. Uh, one of the ways you can help support us uh, is the dunk tank, and it's Dunk a Goon Day. So on uh, the outside area, you have your opportunity to dunk goons. Uh, so, uh, getting, getting down to business, as many of you may know, uh, we have filed a lawsuit against uh, AT&T uh, with regard <coughs> to their cooperation with the uh, NSA warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, some, thank you. I'm sure uh, many of you are, are somewhat familiar with this. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the, the basics about it, uh, so I apologize if it's, if it's not new information to all of you, uh, but uh, to get everybody onto the same, uh, same page. Uh, so we are accusing AT&T of violating the law and the privacy of its customers by collaborating with the National Security Agency in a massive and illegal program to wiretap and data mine American citizens. This all first came to light back in uh, December when the uh, reporting uh, from the New York Times revealed that there was a uh, wiretapping program that was existing outside of the confines of the law. Uh, and uh, uh, somewhat surprisingly, the, the president uh, did admit that uh, the program existed, or at least uh, a portion of the program existed, what he called the terrorist surveillance program. Uh, over time, uh, some further details uh, emerged. Uh, other papers uh, were contributed to the reporting. It was showing that the major telecommunications companies were providing unlimited access to the government. Uh, we, we were very interested in this. We conducted our own investigation. And after we conducted the investigation, we filed a lawsuit in January uh, uh, of this year, uh, alleging that AT&T has opened its key telecommunications facilities and database to direct access by the NSA, uh, and thereby they were disclosing to the government uh, the contents of the customer's communications as well as communications records. Uh, we also allege that uh, AT&T has given the government access to its 300 terabyte Hawkeye database of call <coughs> detail records is one of the largest databases in the world. Uh, and by doing so, by opening its network to uh, the government, by disclosing these records, uh, AT&T has violated the privacy of its customers uh, and the uh, telecommunications laws uh, and, and uh, specific statutes as well as the Fourth Amendment. Uh, our suit is not solely based on the news reports. Uh, we are also supported by the testimony and documents provided by Mark Klein, a former AT&T technician uh, who came forward with some key information. And then we also had an expert, uh, J. Scott Marcus, uh, formerly uh, uh, with the FCC, who looked over it and, and supported the evidence uh, with, with his testimony. Uh, we'd really like to give a, a shout out to Mark Klein. He's a true hero for coming forward. He risked the wrath of AT&T. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the government has not asserted that the Klein evidence is classified. Instead, AT&T has asserted that it is a trade secret and therefore must be kept uh, confidential. Actually, initially, they said that uh, 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 it was so secret that uh, uh, we shouldn't be able to use it in the lawsuit. That didn't work out. Uh, Jason will be talking a little bit more about the trade secrecy aspect of it. Um, but uh, what that means is, uh, uh, for reasons that, that Jason will discuss, we are somewhat limited into what we can say about this, uh, this evidence. Uh, we have a motion that is pending that will allow us to uh, talk very freely about it. But there are some things that, uh, that I can say, uh, and just to uh, uh, give you the, the factual overview. Uh, AT&T's internet traffic uh, in San Francisco runs through fiber optic ca cables at an AT&T facility. A copy of the internet traffic that AT&T receives 
is diverted into a separate fiber optic cable which is connected to equipment in a special room. This room was created under the supervision of the NSA. It contains powerful computer equipment capable of analyzing large volumes of data and connecting to separate networks. This equipment is designed to analyze the data at high speed and can be programmed to uh, uh, analyze it according to user-defined rules. Only personnel with NSA clearances uh, have access to this room. Uh, AT&T's deployment is not particularly modest or limited and it apparently involves considerably more locations uh, that would be required to catch only domestic traffic, uh, sorry, only international traffic as, as the terrorist surveillance program is uh, purportedly limited. Uh, actually, a brief word about that, uh, uh, since this has come up a lot in the talking points about the program, uh, and just a, a note is that uh, they define the so-called terrorist surveillance program as being a program that uh, is limited to international uh, communications. And then they will later say that, uh, oh, this is a very limited program because it is limited to international communications. But by saying it is limited to its definition and then not saying there aren't other programs, that really doesn't give you a whole lot more uh, uh, information. And we believe and have alleged that there is, in fact, a larger surveillance program uh, than uh, what is called the uh, uh, terrorist surveillance program. And the evidence we have is consistent with a national deployment of 15 to 20 locations, uh, possibly more, and it implies that a substantial fraction of AT&T's traffic, uh, uh, certainly uh, well over half, uh, is diverted to the NSA. Uh, and at the same time, the equipment is well suited to the capture and analysis of large volumes of, of this for purposes of surveillance. Uh, so. Uh, now uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Jason, who will talk a little bit about trade secrecy. Thanks. <clears throat> so I just wanted to say a few words about this, because as you can tell, Kurt's being very careful uh, with the details we describe. And um, part of the reason for that is that right now we're lawyers, we're officers of the court, um, and much of the evidence that we've submitted is what's called under seal, which means that it's only available to certain specified lawyers in the case and the judge. Um, and as Kurt mentioned, there are currently, we've uh, made a motion to the court uh, to unseal all the information because we don't believe any trade secrets are in there. There are several media companies from newspapers and magazines and uh, uh, television uh, programs who have also intervened and moved for that as well. Uh, so that's still currently pending right before the judge. We had really hoped he might rule and unseal it all so we could share it all with you today. Um, but this case has also brought out sort of an interesting tension I just wanted to highlight and then I'll mention a little bit more about sort of the categories of things that are sort of at issue um, without mentioning the specifics, uh, which is that more and more as uh, issues of public policy and public importance like this, surveillance things involve technology, we see more and more companies claiming trade secrets, not so much to really protect anything that's competitive, but really to hide their uh, their evil doings. I mean, to sort of cover up the kind of activities they're doing, saying, oh, well, because those activities involve technology, and that technology is proprietary, then you can't get access to it. So this is a case that's a good example of that. Um, and just something to sort of keep in mind whenever you see these kind of cases come around is that, uh, you know, private companies will claim trade secrets sort of for what we think are other reasons, not just simply because they're worried their competitors are going to steal anything. We don't feel like any, we don't feel that any of the information in the client documents or any of the other uh, information that was submitted in the case is, is something that a competitor doesn't already know or is it all useful. Um, so uh, one of the things I just wanted to, um, to uh, sort of highlight was that, uh, so these documents were submitted in the case and uh, the court under these circumstances requires us to, uh, to put them under a temporary seal and so that's kind of where they are now. But we did manage to negotiate uh, um, some of the information to be released. Um, the rest of it is still what's called redacted or kept under seal. Um, but it was sort of interesting to watch the way in which AT&T would fight, you know, tooth and nail over things such as what city this all was taking place in. And so they've now conceded that it's in San Francisco. But for a while they tried to hide the fact that it was even in the city of San Francisco going on or that it was in the, the Northern California regional area, things like that, um, which were sort of silly given, especially that sort of if you walk, if any of you know San Francisco, you can walk by the ballpark and see that it's AT&T Park and that 
their facilities are all you know well situated within the city of San Francisco but that was sort of an example of something they tried to hide they've also tried um, to uh, keep the name of the, of the street and the address of, this, of the facility where this is all happening. And that still is under seal, so I can't comment on what that exactly is. But that's been something of a, of a bit of contention as well. Um, and what's sort of interesting is how can that be a trade secret? How can the address of a facility be something that's a corporate secret, um, especially given the sort of impo important public policy here for the public's right to know what's going on with your private data? Um, let me just check my notes here for a sec. Um, so, yeah, the, just sort of two other things I wanted to quickly mention. Um, oh, and uh, so a couple of the other things that are sort of in there that we hope we can talk about at some point are, as Kurt mentioned, the sort of type of equipment they're using, how it's configured. Uh, th these details are actually in the evidence that we've submitted to the court. So it's sort of further, I mean, the, the amount of detail we've given the court is actually pretty, uh, uh, at a pretty fine level and pretty discreet. And so we hope at some point to share that all with you, and unfortunately we can't right now, but that's the things you can look for if the judge unseals uh, the evidence. Um, uh, the other thing I would recommend is that uh, we did, act and uh, we'll talk about this, uh, a big order came out a couple weeks ago about state secrets and other things that we'll talk about, but also in that order, um, the judge himself does describe uh, sort of uh, his take on what he thinks is going on and kind of what the allegations are and so that can also be very informative from the judge's point of view. Uh, it's a pretty long order, it's 76 pages, but uh, the beginning part which has the factual part uh, is also pretty informative. So I can answer more questions later but just so you understand why we're being a little bit hesitant that we don't want to violate any court orders because the case is going well and we want to keep it going that way. So turning over now to Kevin, who will talk a little bit about the uh, uh, legality of the underlying surveillance and the upcoming bill uh, before the, uh, the Senate uh, about uh, the surveillance. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about why the government is breaking the law and, uh, if you're unlucky, why your provider is breaking the law if you're an AT&T customer. Um, but first I wanted to uh, thank DEF CON for being the one venue where I can unashamedly, nay, proudly, uh, be on a panel unshaven and a bit hungover. So, uh, I, 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 uh, yes, give yourselves a hand. I really can't do that anywhere else. Um, but so, the, the, the basic issue here is that wiretaps require warrants, except in very limited emergency situations. This has been settled law for quite a while, in the late 60s and 1967, there were two Supreme Court decisions, the Katz case and the Berger case, uh, where the Supreme Court held that wiretaps uh, were as invasive, nay, more invasive than physical searches of your home, and they required uh, a search warrant, not, not even, and more than a search warrant, uh, what some of us uh, in the legal community call a super warrant, uh, a warrant that has even more procedural and substantive restrictions than the regular search warrants that they have to get to search your home. Um, these cases were dealing with law enforcement, but in the 70s, in a case that we call the Keith case, it has a much longer and more convoluted title, uh, but we call it the Keith case, uh, the Supreme Court further held that even in cases involving domestic national security where the president has authorized the wiretap, uh, that is illegal, that requires a warrant too. Um, Keith, combined with some other things in the 70s, uh, particularly the church committee's investigations post Watergate, uh, into the Nixon plumbers wiretapping scheme, uh, as well as some illegal NSA programs tapping phone calls and international telegrams such as Shamrock and Minaret. Uh, as a result of those two things, Congress in 1978 uh, passed a law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Now, before this act, the Wiretap Act that Congress had passed after the, the decisions in the 60s, uh, it stri that the Wiretap Act strictly regulated wiretaps, but had a fairly large carve out for uh, interceptions that were authorized by the president for national security purposes. After the shenanigans that the church committee uncovered, they realized that was a foolish thing to do. Um, uh, as uh, uh, one of our, our, our speakers um, said earlier, that was like uh, that, that giving the president that kind of power was like giving a teenager unlimited money, uh, car keys, whiskey, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm misquoting. I'm sorry, the hungover thing. Um, so 
So as a result uh, uh, of these abuses and as a, a result of these, these decisions, uh, Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was meant to strictly regulate even national security related wiretaps. Um, and it set up a, a foreign intelligence surveillance court, which is a secret court in Washington, D.C., which its sole job is to consider and approve uh, secret applications for foreign intelligence surveillance uh, by the government. These are similar to warrants. We don't think they're actually constitutionally warrants. We have a lot of problems with the FISA process. Um, but uh, it is the law. And, and most importantly, Congress said in the law, the Wiretap Act and the FISA, the procedures of those two laws are the exclusive means by which the government can conduct wiretapping. Um, which meant that whatever inherent power the president had, uh, which we think is minimal to non-existent, uh, was reduced to its lowest ebb. Congress, uh, contrary to some of the talking points you may have heard, actually does have a say in what level of power the president has. And when it has spoken on an issue and said, don't do that, the president can't do that. Um, so. Although we don't like FISA, at the very least, it's stuck to the basic premise of individualized warrants. Uh, you target a particular person. For FISA, it has to be a foreign agent. Um, and uh, for FISA, you have to have probable cause that that person is a, a foreign agent. So in December, we found out uh, that the government had completely bypassed even that crappy FISA process, which we hate. Um, and that uh, even though it had been liberalized significantly by the Patriot Act and several subsequent amendments, uh, the president thought it was a better idea to completely ignore the process and um, establish this new NSA program completely outside the bounds of the laws that are meant to be the exclusive means for this kind of surveillance. Um, we also found out beyond wiretapping that there was a program that involved the disclosure uh, of, of everyone's phone records, and we uh, allege also internet records um, indicating who you communicate with when and, and when and for how long. And it was further revealed that this was done with the cooperation of your uh, communications companies and in particular AT&T, which is why we sued them. Um, so our claims against AT&T are, are several. First off, there is constitutional claims, primarily our Fourth Amendment claim that they have violated uh, your right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Now you're probably going, well wait, doesn't the Constitution just protect me from the government? That is true. However, in this case, AT&T is acting as an agent of the government, and so we can sue them for that as well. Uh, additionally to that, we're suing under the First Amendment because uh, it's well established in the law that, that surveillance can chill uh, uh, your expressive capabilities, it, it, you know, uh, the big brother problem. Um, when you are being watched, what you say changes um, uh, to the detriment of all. We are also suing under those statutes that I, that I mentioned, which are the exclusive means, the Wiretap Act uh, and the FISA. Uh, and we are also suing under the federal statutes that regulate the disclosure of your records. They are, they are not nearly as protective as, as the other statutes. Um, however, uh, the government does at least require, uh, the law does at least require <coughs> a subpoena uh, for your records, uh, and, and certainly requires that only, uh, the government only target individuals' records. Uh, there is nothing in the law that would allow the kind of uh, massive wholesale turning over of records that is involved here. So we think AT&T has broken the law. If you want to ask us about some of uh, the government's justifications uh, for this program, which we think are BS, uh, you can ask us about those in questions because we want to have as much time for questions as possible. I'm happy to answer any of those that you like. Uh, but I'd also like to comment a bit on AT&T's defense uh, up to this point, which is essentially a Nuremberg defense. We were following orders. Um, which is funny because they've also admitted in court that unless there is a court order, they haven't been ordered. Anything that they did was voluntary. So they have admitted that whatever we did, and we're not saying we did anything, it was our own choice. Um, and so we, this, the, the issue of uh, whether this Nuremberg defense will, will stand um, hasn't been litigated directly, but it's worth pointing out uh, that Judge Walker in the decision that was mentioned earlier uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago gave a few hints about 
how he's thinking about this. Um, and the most important hint was his statement that no reasonable entity in AT&T's position could have thought that the dragnet surveillance that we are alleging is legal. Um, and we think he's uh, perfectly correct on that point. And uh, I think I'll stop there. And Okay, um, so to give you uh, somewhat of an overview, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what's happened with the case uh, so far. Uh, and one of the key issues in the case uh, has been the state secret privilege, which Cindy will uh, explain uh, a little bit about uh, shortly. Uh, so we filed the case in, uh, in late January um, and uh, filed as a class action, uh, meaning that we are representing or where we'd like to represent uh, should the cloud get, class get certified, uh, all of AT&T's uh, customers, their domestic uh, uh, residential customers. And we have some representative plaintiffs uh, for a variety of services, both their uh, telephone service as well as their internet service, WorldNet, because uh, our allegations include uh, surveillance of, of both telephone and uh, uh, internet services. Uh, the initial response uh, uh, to our lawsuit uh, was uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, because uh, of trade secrecy, saying it was improper uh, for Mark Klein to have provided us with, with the evidence and that uh, in AT&T's view, the only cure for that uh, would be to, uh, that that evidence uh, would be stricken and uh, never be allowed to see the light of day again. Uh, the court did not agree with that position uh, and instead uh, said that we could go ahead with the, uh, with the evidence and then uh, reserving uh, judgment about uh, our position that it should be also uh, available to the public. Uh, the second round of defense were motions to dismiss. Uh, so uh, when you have a lawsuit filed, uh, a number of options are available for responding. One option is to answer the complaint, admit or deny. Uh, the allegations that have been brought against you and present any defenses that you may have. A, uh, uh, a second option is to move to dismiss the complaint. Uh, and that is to say that, that uh, even if everything in the complaint is true, you are contending to the court that the case should nevertheless not, not proceed. Uh, and so both uh, AT&T and the government uh, move to dismiss. And, and uh, to, to drill down a little bit further, we sued both AT&T Corp and AT&T Inc. Uh, AT&T Inc. was formerly known as SBC Communications, uh, and it purchased AT&T Corp. and then renamed itself AT&T Inc. Uh, so there were two motions to dismiss from the two AT&T entities, and then the government intervened. Uh, we, we did not uh, file the lawsuit against the government, but uh, they intervened uh, and also filed a, uh, a motion to dismiss. Uh, and the government's motion, and that's the, the key motion that we'll be talking about in, in more detail shortly, was based on the state secret privilege uh, that the uh, uh, national security uh, required uh, that the case be dismissed. Uh, AT&T uh, uh, echoed the government's motion to some degree, but also asserted that uh, uh, we had failed to state a claim because even if what we had alleged was true, uh, they were entitled to immunity because uh, what they did if, uh, uh, was uh, authorized by the government. Uh, that was what uh, Kevin was just uh, referring to into the, in their, their immunity defense. Uh, and then uh, uh, finally, uh, AT&T Inc. Uh, added a new element, which is to say that there was, uh, yeah, that's better. Uh, thank you. Uh, AT&T Inc. added a new element, which was to assert that uh, we lack jurisdiction. Uh, in, in their view, uh, they were saying we're just a, a, a little holding company out in Texas. Uh, we don't really have much business in, in California. And so it would be unfair to, to uh, haul them before the court. And, um, so uh, uh, the, this, uh, these motions uh, came to uh, decision. 
Uh, we had the hearing last month uh, on June, uh, or the month before last, June 23rd, uh, decision uh, July 20th, uh, and the court denied uh, the motions to dismiss. The both. Thank you. Uh, we were very delighted with that with that decision. Uh, it, uh, uh, of course, uh, was uh, appealed. Uh, both uh, AT and T and the government uh, uh, filed petitions with the Ninth Circuit to uh, uh, appeal the uh, uh, denial of the motion to dismiss. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, they are asking for a stay uh, that the uh, that the case not go forward. Uh, while the appeal is pending. This is a very important issue uh, because uh, it sets the, sets the status quo. Uh, appeals can take years if the whole matter is stayed uh, while the appeal is pending, uh, then that will significantly uh, delay uh, the time when the uh, millions of people who are being surveilled on an ongoing basis can get justice and relief. Uh, where will be a case management conference, the next hearing, uh, and this will be on Tuesday. Uh, where we will deal with a variety of, of issues, but most importantly, uh, the stay. Okay, and so now to uh, uh, give you a, a brief overview of the state secret privilege, uh, Cindy. Hi, everybody. So um, when we filed this case, um, pundits across the country, across the world, and several of whom are sitting in this room right now said, oh, geez, EFF, you're just going to lose. You're just going to lose. And the reason you're going to lose is the government has this secret weapon. Um, the secret weapon is called the state secrets privilege. And whenever they pull out this secret weapon, courts flail in fear and drop the case, and the president gets to do what he wants. So EFF, you know, once again, you're, you know, you're chasing, you know, you're, you're running after uh, uh, windmills here. Um, and, but we actually took a look at the state secrets privilege, unlike some of the people who are commenting on it, and we thought that actually we had a path through it, um, and we had a pretty good path through it. And so we said, you know, don't pay any attention to the pundits, let's take our shot um, and do the best job we can. But it was clear to us that despite the fact that we thought we had a way through it, the state secrets privilege is the government secret weapon, and it is the hardest thing we had to get over. As Kevin has laid out the law for you, you can see that it's pretty clear that if we're right about what happened here, there's a violation of law and there's a violation of the Constitution. That's the easy part of the case in some, in some, in some ways because it's just dead certain that the telephone companies have an obligation to you to not turn your information over to the government unless specific requirements are met. Um, and if we're right about what happened here, those requirements were not even you know, waved at as they went by them. Um, but the secret weapon, the state secrets privilege is the thing that we felt we, is the biggest hurdle for us in moving forward. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it because I think that, that, that if you, you know, that, that it is something that's going to come up again in the case and I'll explain why. Uh, the state secrets privilege is actually pretty old. In Judge Walker's opinion, um, he actually points out that it was first raised in uh, Aaron Burr's treason trial. Uh, right at the founding of the of the the uh, thing, and in that particular trial, I, I didn't know this. The judge taught me this in the decision. Uh, the court actually uh, allowed. Uh, the information to be handed over despite the claim of state secrets. So the very first time it was raised, it appears that it didn't actually result in the immediate dismissal of the case. Um, it's been raised in a number of cases over the years um, involving secret contracts. So if you're, you know, a, a spy uh, working for the CIA and you claim that you've been unfairly treated, um, but in order to explain why you're unfairly treated, you have to talk about what is actually you do for a, you do for a living. The courts have said no; that would require the revealing of state secrets. Um, it's it's been raised in cases where there were accidents. The the first and I think modern case on the state secrets privilege involved a, a plane crash um, of a military plane, and the claim by the government that to explain what happened in this crash would reveal military secrets. Um, it's actually since more recently been revealed that, that people who actually looked at the evidence about what happened in the plane crash indicated that the state secrets, there's no state secrets there and so it was a it was a ruse even then. Um, I don't know the, this personally, I've just read what I see in the papers about this. Um, so it's been used um, and to confirm the targets of spying. Whether, whether you're the target <coughs> of a spy, a specific target of spying, it's been used for this. Um, but in most of these cases, and in the clear case law on this, there is a rule that the government should not invoke the state secrets privilege lightly, 
and that the court has to actually take a, a, a hard look at trying to disentangle any secret evidence from non-secret evidence and to see, to make an honest view to see if the case could actually go forward without the secret evidence. And that's the piece of it that we really harped on in this particular instance. Um, to make our claims under the law, we only have to prove that AT&T is giving this information to the government without the proper securities. We don't actually have to prove what the government's doing with it. While I'd like to know, I suspect everybody might like to know what it is the government's doing with that data after it gets its hands on it. Um, that's, not, that's not where the violation occurs in terms of AT&T's uh, liability here. It, the, 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 what AT&T is forbidden to do is give this information to the government in the first instance. What the government does afterwards isn't particularly relevant to whether AT&T is liable or not. It may be interesting, but it's not really legally relevant. And that's the path that we tried to drive uh, we tried to give to the judge in order to, to go forward. Um, and here, in this case, the judge ultimately agreed with us that the case didn't have to be dismissed at the outset on the grounds of the state secret privilege. And he had a somewhat interesting analysis about why. He basically said, this isn't a secret contract, and this isn't about the targets of surveillance, the specific targets, because if we're right, everybody's being surveilled. We don't need to know who their targets are, um, because all we need to know is that they're handing everybody's stuff over. Um, and, and he said, the government has actually disclosed that it's doing some of this surveillance without a warrant. It's disclosed the terrorist surveillance program. And what it says is very narrow, and it's limited in what it said. But basically, the judge says, you know, the government's opened the door here. By opening the door and saying that this is, they are doing some of this warrantless wiretapping, they've, uh, they've brought this into the public's awareness. And therefore, they can't just open the door and, you know, for the things that benefit them and not open the door for the rest of it. Um, and that's, that was his basic analysis. He also pointed out that while AT&T has been somewhat, I mean, AT&T basically says, of course we help out law enforcement when we think it's legal. Um, and we always, you know, we protect your privacy except when we help out law enforcement and it's in the law. It's pretty much what they've said consistently. But what the judge pointed out, and I think it's dead obvious, is that the government couldn't engage in the terror, even the terrorist surveillance program that it admits without the help of the telecommunications companies. He said that's just dead honest the way it has to be. He pointed out that there are 73 million households uh, served by AT&T in 46 of our 50 states. Um, and he said it's just no secret that the government needs AT&T to do what it is, what it is admitted that it's doing, the, the, the more narrow terrorist surveillance program. And he said, I'm not gonna abdicate my duty as a court to consider a case brought before me based upon a, a situation in which the government has certainly admitted that it's doing something that is legally suspect and just hasn't admitted the rest yet. Um, and he said, the compromise between liberty and security is a difficult one, but dismissing the case at the outset would sacrifice liberty for no apparent enhancement of security. It's probably my favorite quote of the year. So contrary to what the pundit said, the government pulled out its secret weapon and the court didn't duck. The court said no. This is people's constitutional rights at stake. This is the foundation of our system, the idea that the courts are empowered to consider the constitutionality of government actions is one of the core founding principles of our country and I'm not gonna duck and I'm not gonna blink. Um, and we're gonna take this case and we're gonna decide it. Now, he didn't say that he was gonna decide it all the way, that the state secrets privilege wasn't gonna come up again. The path that we gave him was a little more narrow than that. What we said to him is that you're supposed to try to disentangle, there may be some secret stuff here, but you need to try to disentangle the secret stuff from the non-secret stuff and see if we can go forward with just the non-secret stuff. And that's the challenge that we gave him and that's the challenge that he took up. So you're gonna be hearing from the state secrets privilege again as the case goes forward because with each piece of evidence, you can bet the government's gonna say, well, that thing implicate state secrets and that thing implicates state secrets and that thing implicates state secrets and we're gonna have this a little mini version of this battle um, as each step of the way but it's a huge step forward to get this case justiciable in the first instance it's a big victory and Judge Von Walker is not a liberal guy 
He's a he's a straight ahead. He's an, he's a he's a judge who's been on the bench for a long time, and he's really to be commended for not ducking because I think the easy road for him certainly would have been. Um, there's also um, a, a single piece of evidence that has been the focus of some of this, and this is the question about whether AT&T received a piece of paper of any form before it handed this in. This, is, this piece of paper gets called a certification in some of the statutes, and so we call, we've kind of called it that in the context of the case. Um, and the judge actually took on this question of whether we get to see any piece of paper that AT&T had that simply just is the, 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 you know, doesn't say what the government's gonna do with it, but just says, hey, AT&T, please give us this information, or AT&T, we order you to give this information, or AT&T, how'd you like to give us this information? We don't, we don't know what this paper says. Um, or whether there is even one at all. Some of the news reports indicates that maybe this was done without any piece of paper, we don't know. But what we said to the judge is, this, you know, whether there's a piece of paper or not from the government is an important piece here in terms of AT&T's liability and their defenses. And also just, you know, that's, that's one of the pieces that is, is useful to us to figure out whether, um, how, to, how to begin to attack this. We think that even if there is a piece of paper, it doesn't mean that AT&T is home free, not even close. And we have all sorts of arguments about why the piece of paper, there is no piece of paper that could justify what's been going on here for the last four years. Um, but it's a threshold thing. You know, you argue it one way if there's a piece of paper about why the paper doesn't do it. You argue it another way if there is no piece of paper. And so it's, it's an important piece of, of evidence if it exists. The, government, the judge actually went forward and analyzed whether we get the piece of paper. And here's where he did somewhat of a split decision. The judge said because the government has admitted that they're doing wiretapping um, under the terrorist surveillance program, getting the content of messages, um, we're going to let you get any certification that might exist for the content. But the government hasn't admitted or denied publicly whether it's getting the stored records, the stuff that's in the Hawkeye database. Um, so I'm not going to let plaintiffs yet get any piece of paper having to do with the stored records. Time may go on, the government may admit something, the telcos may admit something, and there may be a basis on which we can get that certification, but I'm gonna put you on hold for that one for now, but let's go forward with the content one and see where we go. So it's a bit of a split decision. We're not very happy about the second part of it, about the stored records, and, and, and we'll, we will continue to raise this issue. Um, you will hear as you see the case go forward, us continuing to raise it, but the judge kind of put the two pieces of the case on different tracks. Didn't dismiss the second part, but he put it a bit in the deep freeze until we've got some more evidence, and, and specifically said the evidence that he thinks is important is whether the government's admitted it or the telcos have admitted it. Um, so that's what's going on in terms of the state secrets analysis. And that brings us to, as, as many people probably know, there was a judge in Chicago, a judge named Kennelly, who recently considered a case that was brought by the ACLU against AT&T. Judge Kennelly dismissed the case on the state secrets privilege. But if you actually read the two opinions, they are somewhat consistent. I, mean, I don't like what Judge Kennelly did, but what Judge Kennelly only had half the case in front of him. He didn't have the content part. He only had the stored records part. And what he said was, as to the stored records, there's been no admission or denial by the government or AT&T on those, <laughs> so you can't go forward with that piece of the case yet. But he invited the parties, specifically, and actually I think about three or four times, and he was kind of begging for it, that they amend their complaint, add in the content part, add in a couple other things that he thought were missing. It was a much more narrow case than ours, which kind of was the whole Megillah. And he said, come back to me and let me think about it in the context of the whole thing. Just on the stored records alone, I'm gonna dismiss your case. But come back to me again. And the at and the ACLU, which is handling that case in Chicago, it's actually the plaintiff in that case is Studs Terkel, who some of you may have heard of, he's a somewhat famous journalist. Um, he invited the Turkle plaintiffs to, to amend, and they've taken him up on the challenge, and they've amended the case. They've got the whole case now. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a closer to a mirror case of ours, and they're resubmitting it to the judge. So I think we may see Judge Kennelly revive that case as a result of that. Um, boy, this has gone on. I'm sorry, I went on a little longer. Um, so there's a couple things that you should watch for, and the most important one, though, I want Kevin to talk about, which is while we're doing really well in the courts right now, we've got a long road ahead of us, Congress is threatening to come in and stomp all over us, and um, I'd like Kevin to talk about that, because that's where you can really help us. Hello again. Um, I also just wanted to point out another one of the money quotes from the, from the decision, which was the court said, 
If the government's telling the truth, and this is actually a narrow program, then confirming that will not harm national security in any way. If the government is lying, and it's what we are alleging, the state secrets privilege cannot be used to cover up their misdeeds. And I, I think that is a, a critical conclusion in that case. But um, <laughs> yes, you can thank, thank Von Walker for that. Um, but I, I, we just wanted to close with a, with, a, with a quick pointer to a really disturbing bill that's in Congress right now. It's being sponsored by Arlen Specter, uh, head of the Judiciary Committee. It's in the committee right now. Uh, it has a lot of bad things about it, and I'll talk to you about uh, all of them if you want to afterwards, or you can go to our website to find out. But the one that's most important in the context of this discussion is that it would take all current legal challenges against the NSA uh, or uh, the telecoms that are cooperating with the NSA, take them out of the regular court system, and shuffle them into the FISA court, the secret court in Washington, which its only job for the past 30 years has been to approve secret applications for surveillance. It is the one court most likely to ratify what the president is doing. Um, it is uh, a, a real threat to our case. Uh, the changes it makes to the law generally are a real threat to your liberties and essentially uh, give the government, a, a the president, uh, a blank check or at least a very large check uh, in terms of his authority. It, it would back away uh, from the very strong statement against presidential authority that Pfizer represented in the past. So if you take one action item out of this talk, it is to go to action.eff.org uh, so you can call your senator and say how much you dislike the Specter-Cheney compromise. Uh, because it is not a compromise in the least, it is a capitulation. Uh, and it would be a very sad handover of power by Congress. Um, I think on that note, we're probably ready for questions. Yes, uh, we can take some questions. We have about 20 minutes remaining. Just come and line up in front of the uh, microphone there, and we'd be glad to uh, talk to you. Hi. Um, is there any evidence that any of the other telcos are doing similar things? Because obviously AT&T doesn't handle everybody's calls. So has there been anything about that? There have been some, uh, some news reports uh, regarding other telecommunications providers. Uh, many of the news reports have spoken about uh, major providers without specifying. Uh, a few have actually named names. Uh, most prominently uh, in May, the USA Today uh, had an article which, which uh, uh, named a, a lot of names, uh, AT&T, Verizon, Bell South. Uh, as being participants in the stored records aspect of the program. Uh, and they also mentioned Quest as being asked to be a participant in the program. And then Quest stood up, demanded uh, that I get a court order or certification before they would proceed. Uh, the government refused to provide them with legal process, and so Quest said no. We really appreciate Quest taking that, uh, that step. Since that article came out, uh, Verizon has said that uh, up until a couple of months ago, um, they certainly weren't doing it, uh, and they can't talk about what's going on uh, more than that, uh, and interestingly, they just purchased MCI a couple of months ago. Uh, Bell South uh, has had a, uh, a more uh, uh, aggressive denial uh, of the story. Uh, However, uh, their, their, their denial uh, is that they, they don't have a contract with the NSA, they're not providing it uh, directly. It does leave open the possibility that uh, if, if the information is provided to a third party that subsequently places it in the hands of the government, uh, I, I've not seen them deny that possibility. I'll, I'd also add that uh, on our page about the NSA program, we have uh, quotes and links from most, if not all, of the major stories uh, with new information, um, including that story about the call detail records. There's also another earlier USA Today story about companies participating in the interception program, which did include AT&T and Sprint, and I forget who else. But an important point to make is that even if your provider hasn't been named yet, it's possible they're cooperating. And even if they are not, so long as the NSA has compromised the networks of the largest providers, which often transit the communications of other providers, uh, then you are at risk. Um, and I think the upshot is, is that pretty much all of us uh, are having uh, at least a significant portion of our communications intercepted. Yet another argument for encryption, just in <laughs> case you needed one. 
Um, to follow up on that, Quest was also through a part of a big SEC investigation and other companies that did cooperate with the government that were even more corrupt than Quest, like Global Crossing, were not part of this SEC investigation. And I was curious, something that's really important to me is what incentives are the government giving or disincentives for that causes AT&T to go ahead and do this? I mean, it's were they getting money for this? Were they saying, if you don't do this, we'll investigate you with the SEC? Or what was the story? Well, there? we, of course, don't know what, what uh, uh, secret uh, uh, incentives were, were provided, but there are some pretty straightforward ones that you can look at is that uh, AT&T uh, was in a process of, of doing a variety of, of mergers, uh, something that uh, uh, makes them very beholden to, beholden to the Department of Justice who has to approve those mergers. Uh, the AT&T Corp and SBC merger, there's now actually the Bell South merger, which is also uh, needs to get governmental approval. Uh, AT&T has a lot of government contracts uh, that uh, are, are quite valuable uh, and uh, generally has to be uh, before and beholden to the FCC on a variety of levels. So it puts a lot of pressure on the telecommunications companies. Uh, and uh, that's why it was just a remarkable thing for, uh, for Quest to stand up and we, we only wish that, that more had, had that courage. On, on the other hand, in the federal court hearing, the representative, the lawyer for AT&T said, we could say no. We didn't have to say yes. Well, we're not saying whether we said yes or no. We don't mean that. But theoretically, in some alternate universe, we could say no. And I found that to be kind of um, interesting for, as, a, as a strategic decision for them to make. Um, because then I think that they do, you know, they do. They have taken on responsibility for what happened here, and they aren't just saying, "Well, we didn't have any choice because otherwise, you know, they had guns to, you know, the secretary's heads or something like that." They've said that they had the choice, and I think that's going to be an interesting admission as we move forward to see whether they try to move away from it or, or what that means for them, because it really does put them on the hook. It makes them responsible for their their uh, actions in a way that uh, makes it easier for us. How many of you have had your biggest client come and ask you to do something ridiculous and illegal? You know? um, the U.S. government is AT&T's single largest client. Um, the economic incentives are fairly clear. Um, why, why is it that EFF didn't go against uh, all the telecoms? Uh, were they not similarly situated? Was it a resource issue? Is there a statute of limitations uh, that will run out? Or can your precedent, when you get a precedent, be used against these other telecoms? And uh, as a separate question, uh, what are the, the implications of AT&T changing its privacy policy or putting a provision in its uh, contracts with its uh, subscribers that have them, you know, waived lawsuits for this? Uh, is, is it legal to have the customers waive lawsuits or will there always be a cause of action regardless of what the customer signs? Thank you. So, can you want to take the first part, I'll take the second. Yeah, um, the first question about why didn't we sue all the telcos, it's kind of a mix of things. One is we had the, the best evidence about AT&T. We had Mark Klein. I mean, Mark Klein didn't work for Verizon. He worked for AT&T. So we had actually specific, powerful, factual evidence about one telco. And we wanted to lead with the strongest case possible. Um, we also had more specific evidence about, uh, we had more uh, news reports. I mean, we filed in January before the, the, the USA Today story came out in, in May. In January, we had uh, news reporting and other reporting about the Hawkeye database, but we didn't have uh, uh, any public information yet about the others. So it was, um, it was our best case, and we wanted to put our best case forward. Now, there are 35 cases across the country against the various telcos. I think pretty much all of them have been sued at, at this point. Um, and there is a process by which all these cases are, are uh, being, Verizon wanted to combine all of the cases. If they all get combined, we may end up all in one big soup anyway. Uh, watch for that order. It should come out in the next month or so. Um, and, and we argued that all the cases, if they're going to be combined, should go to Judge Walker. The government, uh, not surprisingly, said if all the cases are going to be combined, they should go to our really good friends in the D.C. courts, who we all are buddies with. And, and that, that, that debate uh, may change the tenor of our, of our case itself even, uh, even further. Um. Okay, so um, we only have 10 minutes uh, left, so we got to uh, move no, along no, quickly. No, actually, we have even less. He said uh, zero. We get 10 minutes less than we thought. Oh, 
never mind. Uh, well, then we'll just, uh, if you want to come talk to us afterwards, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you more, and we'll be at the uh, uh, booth. Uh, in or the, at the uh, dunk tank, because yeah. they're dunking goons right now. Come on, you guys. Yes, you please go, go to the dunk goons. tank right now. Uh, DT is in the tank at the moment. Zach is up next, so please go get them wet. If you have questions we couldn't answer, we will be at our booth. And if you think what we're doing is cool, please join us. Uh, we have, uh, EFF has, um, you know, we have, we stand on the shoulders of all the people who are willing to stand up and say, I'm going to be a member of EFF. It makes our voice much stronger, not only in Congress, but when we stand up in front of the courts and we say we actually represent, you know, we represent the nerds, we represent the geeks, we represent the people who know how these technologies work. And the more people we have, you know, the stronger our voice. So if you think what we're doing is cool, please join. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you all.